Um, let me start by introducing Lib um, to you all. Lib's been the director of the, of the London Violence Reduction Unit since March 2019. Immediately before that, for six years, she was leader of Lambeth Council and she'd spent in total 18 years as a Lambeth councillor um, and and obviously she resigned from that role when when she became when she started working for the for for the mayor of london um, a, 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 a strand that runs throughout lib's career is her interest in in challenging uh, violence against women and girls uh, and her appointment was really welcomed um, because of that expertise and the consistency of, of her interest in the issue. She's done lots of other things and I could um, keep you from her for a long time by describing her many other roles and achievements but actually that's not what today's meeting is about. So Lib, I'm going to hand over to you. Great, well thank you very much um, for inviting me to speak. Um, I have to say it does feel slightly surreal uh, sitting in my front room talking to a, a sort of unseen and unknown audience um, in these absolutely um, extraordinary times and I think it's the first time I've spoken where um, violence actually hasn't been the number one um, political issue. Um, although of course what we are seeing at the moment is um, many of the issues that we talk about in the context of violence actually also coming to the surface so very sadly we are you know even within this time seeing a, a big rise in domestic abuse and domestic violence um, we're talking a lot about young people and how you keep them engaged and how you keep them inspired um, and of course the whole thing is one big huge public health um, emergency and uh, we've talked about violence in the context of a public health approach so it is all very surreal but there is actually some connection I think between some of the things that we're talking about in the moment in relation to Covid and some of the ways in which we are um, trying to tackle uh, violence. So um, as you mentioned I've been in post for a year um, and although some good preparatory work was done by a wide range of partners um, both within City Hall and outside City Hall to get us to a position when I started that we had a violence reduction unit up and running. Um, it still very much is only only a year, um, despite sometimes what the papers and the press uh, like to uh, like to say. Um, so I'm going to try and keep um, this relatively brief because hopefully there will be some questions. And also, I'm sure it's hard to keep people's interest when there's you know kettles nearby and family demands and um, you know just trying to engage with a computer screen for, for that long and um, I was just going to as, as I've been briefed I was going to just give a few sort of reflections I suppose on a year I was going to uh, talk a little bit about what we've tried to do over that year um, and then finally just present a few challenges I think as we as we move um, forward so um, the first for me is a, is a really interesting one it's how we hold the positive and the negative at the same time and I think it's really pertinent in the way we tackle uh, violence reduction. We are constantly analysing things through statistics and yet we know of course that that doesn't give anywhere near the measure of pain that so many people experience or feel as a result of bereavement or the consequence of, of violence. But while I've been profoundly moved both as my time as Lambeth leader and, and also as the director of the, of the unit, um, in meeting those uh, relatives and family members and uh, friends of, of victims. Um, I'm also hugely struck by the positive energy they bring very often to trying to tackle um, violence reduction. And that's exemplified by people like the Ben Kinsella Trust, um, Dwayne Amix um, in Lambeth, or even Peter when his daughter uh, Jodie was killed uh, only a year or so ago, um, immediately wanted to do something. It's amazing, I think, in the depths of despair that people reach for something positive to try and do. And I think what's, what's, what's strange, or not strange about that, I find that personally hugely uplifting and there is loads of things going on across London. But what, what I suppose is, is the, um, the kind of irony in many ways around that is that when you talk to people who are outside of that bubble, when you say to them what your job is, or when they ask you how it's going, the first thing that they, that they say is, oh, well, can you really do anything? And so th there seems to me to be a massive message here about talking about um, how much positivity there is, how much engagement, how much energy there is in the sector to tackle violence reduction that is really not known about beyond the people working on it. Um, and so I think that is a huge challenge. 
The second reflection is that prevention and enforcement, people talk about prevention as common sense. Some of the polling we've done would recognise that people begin to see that more as a, as a, you know, they don't see just curbing violence through police actions as being an obvious way to tackle it. They see it's much more complex than that. Um, but at the same time, um, there is no translation of that understanding into real resources. A report we did um, last, uh, actually it was this year, beginning of this year, our strategic needs assessment looked at three billion pounds in the last year spent on dealing with violence, either in terms of the run, in the, um, uh, in the, the run up to violence, in dealing with the immediate incident, or indeed then the aftermath care that is needed. Three billion pounds. What we need to be doing is really presenting that as an opportunity to spend our resources much more widely. That will be hard, I think, in a post COVID world to cling on to that, but it's absolutely essential uh, that we do. The third, I think, uh, reflection is the importance of the long term and the, the inevitable magnetic pull of people wanting to see short term results. And that's very understandable, I think. People have, you know, are looking outside what's happening on the streets, looking what's what's happening in terms of figures for domestic abuse, and they want to see results, and rightly so. But at the same time as answering that, I think we absolutely need to keep with the long-term um, perspective. And, and in some ways, um, the, perhaps the public health rhetoric that we are going to be talking about for so much longer now as a result of COVID will, will maybe help with that. Um, but we've really got to hold on, I think, to the long term. This cannot be a quick political fix. And we've seen before when focus has been put on certain areas um, uh, uh, at certain points, people have focused in on how to uh, reduce violence, but then it's dissipated that energy. And as a result, we've seen um, uh, sharp uh, rises. And then finally for me, and this is perhaps no, no big revelation, given that, as you mentioned, I was a local councillor for 18 years, but unless we work with communities, all of the efforts that we are doing are really not going to go anywhere in my, my experience. Um, and that is a harder challenge, I think, than some people may realise um, who don't perhaps work in, in the public sector and therefore don't understand how organisations work. It is definitely about giving away control. It is definitely government realising and to a certain extent City Hall realising and to an even lesser extent local government realising that unless they are working alongside people, supporting their efforts and enabling their efforts, not really going to um, get anywhere. And, you know, when I first started, there was a big plan for, you know, setting up lots of new networks around violence reduction. Um, and it seemed to me that was entirely missing the point. Because going back to my, my first point, there are loads of initiatives, there are loads of things going on. What we need to be doing is strengthening them, enabling them, connecting them and evaluating them. So those are probably the four kind of messages for me over the period of, the, of a year that, uh, you know, have been reinforced um, and uh, something that we take really seriously in the unit about how we're going to move forward. So what have we done with all of that? Well, um, I suppose what we've done um, is we have tried to marshal as much information and intelligence as we can. And I use those two words um, very deliberately because I think sometimes they're quite different. We've done our strategic needs assessment um, and we did a review of all the homicides that have taken place over the last three years. We've got a rich source of information there on which to build and shape our programme. We are bringing together public sector partners to share information and we're working closely with the um, Information Commissioner's Office. We've got a bit of a free pass to work out what are the real barriers between sharing information. But that information needs to be, I think, um, accompanied by um, intelligence and intelligence is going out and talking to people and learning from their experience and making sure that we aren't missing in that deluge of statistics we aren't missing really the essence of the problem and so while we're based in city hall we spent an enormous time time out of city hall and that's been very very deliberate and i'm sure darwin later on will be able to to talk about some of that and that combination of intelligence and information has really shaped up our program of investment um, when I started the job, I knew I was going to get, um, obviously, a budget from the mayor. I wasn't at that point aware that we were also going to get a chunk of money um, from the Home Office. Um, I think that put us in a slightly better place from lots of other uh, violence reduction uh, units because they hadn't as yet been set up. We had a few months in which to think through a bit of a strategy, think through where we wanted um, to put those uh, resources. 
Um, but nonetheless, um, it was obviously a, a huge challenge and a huge opportunity to suddenly get more money in August, um, albeit um, the challenge was uh, to make sure that we spent it. That was, the, that, that, that was essentially the first uh, rule of thumb of the, the Home Office money. Um, so what we've done with that is tried to uh, use our financial leverage in the best uh, possible way. We've tried to make sure that we are adding um, to gaps where we think that there are gaps. We've tried to put money in things that we know are already working and we've tried to do some innovation. And we've also tried to make sure that we have welcomed bids from a, consolidate, from a con consortium of different organisations. Um, really aware that going back to that theme, we wanted to bring, bring uh, people together. And that, I think, has given us um, a place where we want to really try and influence key points in young people's lives. We've spent a lot of time trying to give more power, to give more voice, to give more opportunity to young people. Um, we've looked and listened and heard that the key relationships for young people are either in schools with teachers and therefore how we keep them in schools and how we build on inclusive school programs has been important, how we work with youth workers and empower a very neglected um, profession um, and how we really strengthen parents um, and the networks that they are part of. Um, and so a lot of our resource has gone into um, areas such as that alongside obviously really you know, obvious schemes around early prevention. And in recognition of the fact that it's not all about how you invest in people, it's sometimes how you, the, the, the place as well is as is, is, is important. We work very closely with local authorities, developing violence reduction plans um, and making sure that we are helping, you know, the barnets of this world to learn from the barkins of this world and um, to make sure that there's a real kind of sharing of, of expertise uh, throughout the 32 London boroughs and have connected in with public health in those boroughs and also um, with the police. We're hoping as we go forward to do even more um, targeted uh, work. And as well as the programme then, we've started to put more emphasis on evaluation and key to that is obviously a partnership. So yes, we want to see a downward trend, of course, in, in violence and we monitor the statistics. Of course, we need to be on top of those programmes and being able to see and assess their impact. Absolutely, we need to be able to talk about the, the benefits um, and the advantages of having a violence reduction unit. All of this needs to be evaluated. But we're in the business of the wider impact of violence reduction, I think, across London. Um, and absolutely key to that has to be partnerships. It's consolidating our relationship with the Met. It's working closely with the NHS, which we're delighted now has a, a director for um, a, a clinical director for violence um, reduction. It's really making sure that we've got those uh, local authority uh, relationships. It's absolutely trying to empower um, communities. Um, and through that partnership, we hope that we'll be able to build a much wider and richer picture of how you reduce uh, violence across London and critically make uh, people uh, feel safer. And then turning that partnership really into uh, advocacy. You know, the mayor is, and the foremost citizen of London. He has huge access um, to uh, government. He also has the most powerful voice in terms of setting the tone, I think, of, of London and making sure, therefore, that we are drawing from all that experience to talk about why we want to reduce exclusions and what we need to do, why youth workers need to be much more valued, um, why they need to do reviews that aren't just um, as a result of abuse and neglect, but actually reviews for all homicides um, that take place and need to give support to local authorities to be able to do that. And through that, I think tailoring a London-wide message about we don't want to accept the state we were, we were in uh, pre-COVID. Pre we want to make sure that violence isn't inevitable and that we are all feel empowered uh, to do something um, about it. And going back to that point of those people you meet who say, well, you can't really do anything anyway, want to make sure that they can't say that again in a year's time, that they're very clear what you can do and that they're more interested in getting involved because you've got sort of a proven path to success. So that's in a nutshell is what we've been, um, what we've been about um, for a year. And I hope that generates some, some questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Lib. That was a really um, detailed and an interesting introduction. And if I could kick off 
um, questions and then I'll I'll keep an eye on the chat line and, and I'll fire further questions to you. We were uh, we had more than a year ago the the, the great um, pleasure to have Karen McCluskey from Glasgow mm. come and speak at one of our one of these meetings uh, and she spoke as she does brilliantly well, very inspiring and I think we all left um, the meeting with a number of, of, of messages which hopefully we've been able to take forward. The, 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 if, if there was one single point that she made that, that, that I took to heart, uh, and you've certainly covered it, uh, was, was the idea that it actually takes a long time to, to really turn around what was mm. clearly in Glasgow a desperate situation, what is in London and, and several of the English cities a really desperate situation. And, and you've alluded to the fact that, that, that politicians completely understandably are driven by much shorter term agendas. And also, and you might be a bit critical of some politicians in this regard, I wouldn't expect you to be, but, but I might be. There is sometimes a, a sort of populist tendency to suggest there is a simple solution and we're gonna put it in place and, and not. Do you see any progress in, in both uh, London politicians and national politicians who you discuss this issue? Do you see a growing awareness of this point. I think, I think uh, Karen talked to us about 15, 16 years to really begin to, to see the, 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 the seeds of change. And she certainly talked about the first few years, there being no uh, apparent development. So it, it, uh, is, there, is there hope for us there? And, and sort of developing that slightly, is there any advice that you could give to, to us as representatives of a number of, of criminal justice agencies about what we might be able to do to try to to um, encourage that longer term view of things okay yeah no thanks I mean I had the privilege of um, meeting with uh, Karen just as a sort of one-to-one -one fairly uh, soon after I'd started and I've sort of heard her speak subsequently and yeah she absolutely is you know incredibly inspirational but one of the things she did say to me is that you know the London VRU is bound to be hugely in the spotlight because of the politics around London um, and uh, because because of the you know high rate of incidents which you would expect given population but nonetheless you know put, puts it in that puts it in that that, that place which makes it much harder um, to sort of escape that short termism, because I think you're right, you know, politician, populist votes, short termism is definitely an arc um, of, uh, of connection. Um, I, I, think, I think there is some cause for hope, definitely. Um, I thought that, um, you know, I thought that uh, the mayor's speech um, in August of last year, I don't know if people have a chance to read that, it's definitely online, talked as much about uh, the causes and the long-term causes of violence um, um, and uh, as he did about um, enforcement. And I think uh, being tough on the causes as well as the consequences of crime is a phrase that's been much used before, but nonetheless is a very pertinent one. Um, so I, I, I do think that's positive. Um, I do think it's actually positive that the Home Office set up um, violence reduction units across the country. The fact that we're in our second year of uh, funding is positive. It is a change. It is a recognition that it is a bit more complex than, you know, um, you know, putting police officers um, on the beat, which I'm not saying is a simple thing either, I should stress. Um, so I do, I do think there are, there are those sort of, um, there are those signs of hope but it's going to be a massive ongoing challenge. I really, really think that. And to answer your question about what could, I, what do I think criminal justice agencies could do? I think it is coming together really and, and making a fairly clear statement and a consistent statement. And I'm hoping that the London VRU can help sort of mobilize that and marshal that in a way, amplify that about the fact that it cannot be a quick fix. Because once you kind of, you know, politicians also listen to what is um, the loud message as well. And if we can make that a loud message, then there won't be any excuse for not hearing it. Um, and uh, so I, th I think it's, there's some hope, but some challenge, but I think it's doable. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the very good news is the questions are pouring in. Uh, oh. I don't know whether everyone else can see them or whether only I can see them, but, but if I read them out, 
um, then um, I'll, I'll do it one at a time. But um, and then we can take it from there. And and, and um, I, I'm 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 really sorry, but the first question there've been so many so already. But the first question has already dis disappeared off my screen. But we will sort that one out and we'll come back to it. So so despair not. But the first question, therefore, I've got here um, uh, is is from Charlie Weinberg. Uh, and Charlie says, hi, Lib, thanks for your reflections, all very interesting and notable. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is any scope or need for the Violence Reduction Unit to raise and hold to account what may dis many describe as state violence? For example, use of joint enterprise, stop and search, rates of death in custody and impacts of austerity, particularly in the current light of vulnerabilities and insecurities highlighted by COVID. Is it possible this kind of systemic attention could help rebuild, create some level of confidence for communities and people who feel very suspicious and dubious? Okay, well, that's an absolutely huge question, isn't it? Um, uh, just a couple of reflections on it. I think we've absolutely got to make the point around um, austerity. And um, that links up to the earlier point, you know, three billion uh, spent last year around um, on violence or not spent on violence, but, you know, the cost of violence being uh, three billion. And um, if you look at how much money has come out of some of the organisations uh, that we know play such a vital, vital role in tackling the long term, long term causes of violence, uh, you immediately see the disparity. So absolutely around uh, the austerity point. Your second point, which I think was a broad Order one, which is really around confidence in institutions and um, how do you address that because confidence in institutions obviously means that you know people people need you know people need to see other organizations need to feel confident um, in the system um, I, I think the VOUs are probably part of that but I, I don't think actually that's necessarily the VOUs role to lead that um, so, for example, within within City Hall, um, you know, the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime, you know, has a scrutiny role over the police. Um, I think that they, uh, you know, they obviously do that role and they need to be talking about that role. And that's how you would begin to engender um, more confidence. But your point around um, and obviously the mayor has other powers and where he needs to be speaking up. Um, about other institutions, I think he does, but clearly he needs to be doing uh, doing that on some of the agendas that you've been talking about. So I don't think we can be, I don't think we can ignore the impact of uh, people's feelings around confidence of institutions at all. And we need to play our part in trying to uh, get those institutions to empower people rather than take power back themselves. But I think probably our role at the moment um, means that we are a partner in that rather than a leader in that. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. I have now, Jamie's very kindly retrieved the first question, <laughs> which is from Benula Ratcliffe. Um, and and uh, Libet, this is the question. The introduction of knife crime prevention orders were opposed by youth offending teams, by the LGA, which of course you've got a previous association mm -hmm. with. Uh, NGOs, etc., but supported by the Mayor of London. Do you think it's going to be a key tool in reducing youth violence in London? Okay, no, I don't think it's a key tool. I think it's uh, probably one of several. Um, the key tools I see is much more around some of the, the things I was talking about um, earlier on, really. It's how you uh, engage young people. Um, it's, it's how you inspire young people, it's how you give young people confidence. And I think that is all, that's where we should be waiting uh, the argument. So the business I'm much more in is, you know, how do you uh, listen to what young people have to say? How do you give them voice? How do you give the, the people, the young people who are most vulnerable more support? And how do you give sort of positive activities, um, which are pathways into employment and therefore opportunity for young people? So my emphasis would be on that. Uh, knife orders are a part, a, you know, literally a tool um, in, um, in, in the different, uh, in, in the different Different ways in which you can tackle this issue but I, I don't think it's the key tool no thank you for that right I've got a question now from Gemma Buckland uh, and Gemma uh, asks this she says the transition to adulthood alliance funded by Barra Cadbury Trust has called for a distinct approach to the treatment of young adults based on the fact that they're still developing their psychosocial maturity do you advocate a distinct approach? And if so, do you find it lands with your partners? Are some agencies more receptive than others? Okay, um, 
I think it's key, actually, um, that we don't just look at young people up to the age of 18. Um, I think that, I mean, my reflections actually on being leader of a council was how odd it was that you had a children's services department that looked at young people up to the age of 18 and then you pass people on to an adult social services uh, system and actually you dropped the people in the middle. And it was, I think, one of the best examples of how uh, we looked at things from an institutional perspective rather than an individual perspective, because when you knew that person was in children's services, they may well need support going into adult services. Um, so it seems to me absolutely key that we look at the individuals and therefore those same individuals that potentially are going to need support and therefore the idea of um, uh, the idea of sort of saying that somebody stops being a child at 18 um, and therefore we we don't sort of give them the same level of attention going forward is is completely misguided. Um, so uh, we have very deliberately said for the young people, young, uh, from the perspective of the violence reduction unit, young people are, you know, up to the with that i mean local authorities struggle with that could i just interrupt in, um, yeah yeah sure your your feed went went quiet and you just oh. got to you'd said young people up to the and i was all oh. my ears <laughs> waiting to hear the age you were going to give and then we lost okay. or certainly i yes, lost the rest okay, i'm sorry about that i did then just no, get no. a little thing internet connection unstable which i've not had before so hopefully it won't come up again um up to the age of 25 uh, we have talked about um but as I was saying, I think the point is more profound than that, really. It's looking at people and individuals um, rather than looking at it from an institution point of view. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. So I've got a question um, from, from my deputy chair, uh, mm. uh, from Why Me, who would like to ask, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, with the proven value of restorative justice and approaches in addressing the impact of crime and conflict, its flexibility in addressing family and community impact as well. How has the unit addressed the use of restorative practice in achieving the same? Thanks, thanks Lucy for the question. Oh, that's a big question. And I think in our year one, I'd have to say with limited impact, but do we agree with the principles behind restorative justice? Absolutely. Um, I mean, prior to, um, becoming leader of the council. For some period, I worked for an organisation called Justice, which was a legal human rights organisation, or uh, well, still is. Um, and um, it did a lot of work on research going over to Canada and to Australia, um, from mem no, New Zealand, actually, um, and Australia, and really learning about some of the, 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 the uh, restorative approach and the family conferencing and uh, me, you know the principles around conflict resolution and mediation and I've, I've always thought that that was a real strength actually in terms of the um, approach and I think while we've not probably embraced it in the kind of fundamental way you were um, posing the question I think in actually a lot of the ways that we see the most effective relationships between adults and uh, young people and I mentioned some of those through youth workers through teachers um, uh, parents, it, those principles are the ones that are brought to the fore, actually. It's that kind of conflict resolution um, management uh, style of, of, of behaviour, really, and conduct that, become, that becomes key. And, and certainly within the schools um, programme that we are supporting, um, it's very much around inclusive education. It's trying to, you know, make sure that, the that there is a reduction in the number of exclusions. So that very powerfully um, when we went to uh, Glasgow, uh, reinforced by our relationship with the De Director of Education there, um, uh, Maureen McKenna, who's been very involved in sort of shaping up some of our work and uh, the organisations that we're supporting take those principles to take those fundamental principles to heart. So the tender programme, the nurture programme, all of those are very much around a kind of conflict resolution approach uh, to dealing with young people and you'd want to max that up into more restorative justice schemes i think uh, um, when we look at yeah criminal justice system brilliant thank you um i i'm i'm i've got a question from our director nina and since nina can unmute herself i'll leave her to ask that okay. herself hi Deb. um hi, i was nina. really impressed in the strategy when i first read it that one of the core elements of it was around addressing uh, the narrative around criminal justice mm -hmm. um, and violence rather um, and so I just wanted to understand what you've done in terms of that particular objective and why you think that's really important. 
Well, I think it's really important because it comes back to the point I suppose I was trying to make through the presentation um, that um, we need to feel empowered to be able to do something about uh, violence. And we also need to know there is hope in how we tackle it. And we need to, to, to therefore, I think hope is one of the big things about empowering people. Um, and so therefore we need to both reflect activities that are already going on and build that into the message. And, and the converse is also obviously true. Um, you know, that if, 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 if um, and, I, and I do think the police should stop using big pictures of knives um, in, in their activity, but if you are showing big pictures of knives, then you are disempowering people because you're making them feel frightened. Um, you know, if you are seeing headlines on um, and newspapers or uh, stuff through social media that is really playing up um, the huge fear element, then people are going to become more fearful. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, there's a real challenge there in making that happen how we've been trying to do that. I'm not going to steal Darwin's thunder too much because he's been very much involved in that. Um, but it's been making sure that we have been listening and therefore acting on what young people are telling us and what communities are telling us. And so we've got um, in place and are developing uh, a sort of young people's leadership uh, programme where we, where we know that we can be confident of the young people we're talking to really being within their community and having experiences that we can learn from and it is that word learn from and listen um, that, that so so important that helps us to shape um, a much more positive narrative so we've been trying to do that as well as going out and talking a lot um, all of us about you know how um, the message needs to change um, and we've also got an, an interesting project which I'll let Darwin talk more about around social switch which is around um, messaging um, and using sort of uh, social media and again in some of the other programs we've been doing talking about the kind of positives rather than dwelling too much on the negatives and that kind of even gets into what I was just saying about some of the schools program um, where it's not necessarily thou shalt not exclude it's more about let's promote the positive benefits of keeping kids in school um, and let's try and make that happen okay Thank, thanks Liv that's great um, um just to say we've now reached uh, 38 participants and to repeat to those who've joined us as the webinar has proceeded if you've got a question do send it through to 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 Jamie via the chat um, column and I will see it and I will pass it on to Lib but Lib bef but before we we generate any more questions let me ask you another one from 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 my perspective one of the things that we are acutely aware in the criminal justice alliance is that we're not simply a london and, and the southeast organization yeah. um and and we can appear that you know because there are you know such a large number of people living in london because mm -hmm. so many of our member organizations are based in london we can appear a bit obsessed with london issues now i i think probably everyone would acknowledge that that this agenda uh, is, is a national agenda but but the tools to address it are primarily held locally. I wonder whether you could describe a little bit about how you link up with equivalent people and functions elsewhere in the country and again you know if there is anything that you feel we could help in in that process yeah. do don't hesitate to to describe that as well. Yeah brilliant okay thank you well I've obviously already referred to the fact that we you know fairly early on uh, made a visit to Glasgow we learned a lot from there and we've kept those connections up we know London's very different to Glasgow, but nonetheless, there is a lot of learning there. And, and Karen, as you said, is hugely inspirational uh, character who's been doing this work for so long that, you know, is a real repository of knowledge. Um, the, the, the fact that the um, Home Office grant uh, came out in, in August of last year, I think we finally, finally saw the money, um, uh, prompted the, the establishment of 17 other uh, violence reduction units across the country. Um, and um, it's been really, really, interesting I think meeting up as networks and uh, as units rather and, and forming a network um, around violence reduction to just learn about the different challenges people have got the different perspectives they're bringing to those problems and making sure that we're in regular contact and um, sharing sharing ideas sharing information sharing ways in which we're going to evaluate um, and learning from one another and you know I've really I mean, Kimberly is going to be on your panel later on, but we've struck up a good relationship. You know, I'm speaking to Manchester tomorrow. Uh, we've had visits from South Wales. We've uh, spoken at length to Liverpool. There is a lot that we can capture through, through that, which is really important. Um, and then I suppose the other point, and this is perhaps relevant to, you know, some of the organisations um, in the Criminal Justice Alliance, you know, we work with 
um, a network of charities. And some of those, yes, are just London focused, but many of them aren't, many of them are national. So through working closely with BCS colleagues, um, um, a, a slightly bigger size perhaps in some of the community groups that I was talk, referring to earlier on you know we are in a position to gain their insight into what they're doing um, across the country so um, I completely agree with your premise that it's uh, incredibly important not to become uh, London centric although there is a huge problem in London and a lot of complexity in London in terms of structures um, and uh, you know different organizations um, but we are in a good position and getting increasingly more Think able to look outside and learn from uh, wherever, both both nationally actually, but also internationally. Um, you know, some gr great practice going on in Chicago. Uh, we had a couple of visitors from there recently. There's some really interesting uh, work going on uh, through the sort of Safer Cities UN program. There's some good stuff going on in New York as well. So um, yeah, it's a really important part of of learning and evaluation. <clears throat> Thank you. That's great. Um, I've got a question now from Olivia Denavi. Um, women are often left out of discussions of violence, mm -hmm. with the emphasis placed on young men or else women are represented as victims. Has this been your experience or how are women affected by violence? What part do they play in the perpetration or reduction of violence? Um, well, if that is the case, we shouldn't allow that to happen. Um, that's my, my first point. Um, I, I think there definitely is a tendency um, to set up violence reduction uh, units um, to address what was perceived as the biggest problem, which was sort of knife crime and public violence. And actually, um, rightly, we need to keep challenging that. Uh, we keep needing to challenge it because you know, we don't want to see um, you know, unseen uh, victims of domestic abuse. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know that any death, any violence is something we should be actively working against. There is no kind of hierarchy. Sometimes it is portrayed. So I think that's that's really important. It's also really important because we know all of the issues are interlinked. Um, you know, we, we do know that you know if a young person has been um, you know brought up in a household where they've you know experienced or witnessed um, domestic abuse, they are absolutely much more likely um, not. It's not. Um, not inevitable by any means at all but the, you know the statistics show it is much more likely they're also going to be a victim or a perpetrator uh, later on in life so to break the cycle to really give meaning to this idea of preventing uh, violence taking place and early intervention we absolutely also need to be tackling it and 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 you know as a feminist i you know i get very fed up with the focus being on you know men in society and things become a problem when they're affecting men um but not necessarily a problem when they're more affecting women um so there's a fundamental challenge for us there and 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 to to pick up on one other point that you uh, raised which is i think around um and I use the word victims, I do try and use the word survivors because I think there is something much more powerful about that. And it's the same point that I've raised before really is that somehow powering and empowering has to be the route to people feeling that they can get out of a situation. Um, and therefore that's important for us to use that, use that language. Great, thank you. We, we're, mm -hmm. Colleagues, we've got, um, we've got Lib for about another five minutes or so. Um, we've, we've gone through all the questions that we've received on the chat line. So this is really a last call for any further questions or indeed from anyone who's already asked the question and would like to, to ask another question. Um, please, please feel free to do so. Before I see any appearing on my screen, can I just ask our other panelists who, who if, if any of them would like to ask uh, uh, Lib a question, um, just uh, un, 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 uh, uh, mute yourselves and feel free to fire away. I won't just... Sorry, could I just suggest something? If yeah, of course a, you can. A bit of a lull. Um, so um, I suppose I'm really curious um, and keen to make sure that uh, we stay kind of connected and that there is a sort of flow of information between your your members and the best way of doing that um because there's obviously a huge amount of experience across the sector that tap into the alliance um and it's really important for us i think to to, to sort of have those links so uh 
we do have a newsletter that we try and put out every every month and would want to encourage people to sign up to that we are very much open to you know listening to the work that people are doing um, and um, you know we do have our strategy that Nina mentioned um, published so people can, can look at that we have a website which I have to say is going through a bit of a, a rejig at the moment but nonetheless will be very good in, in, in about a month's time um, so there are lots of ways we would want to encourage and continue a kind of conversation with you and um, also very happy to share with you I, I did a, an article of a kind of reflection of a year on I'm very happy to you know for you to use that in your your network as well if that's of, of any help it will be of huge help thank you huge help and we have uh, a a very regular bulletin that we send out to to all of our members so so mm -hmm. we'd be very happy to give you airtime in relation to that um right i've got a a, a couple of further questions ellie mm -hmm. roberts asks uh, thanks for your reflections, Lib. Really interesting to hear about the work of your unit. You've mentioned the importance of evaluation and the importance mm -hmm. of assessing the impact of programmes. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on what evaluation should or could focus on, given the issues that haven't been discussed or anything else that hasn't been mentioned. Uh, and Ellie works for the National Centre for Social Research. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to hear, I think you're probably better placed to give me your reflections on what good evaluation looks like. Um, and, and we certainly are in the business of taking ideas and uh, uh, copying them where they're good. So that would be really, really um, important for us. Um, I think what we're clear about um, and uh, is that we want to make sure uh, that we're not only looking at the statistics, but we're looking at the impressions and we're looking at people's feelings and that we're building on that kind of anecdotal intelligence base alongside um, some of the raw, uh, raw data in terms of the evaluation. Um, so it's not just how many, you know, how many young people come through the door for a particular programme, but it's what the impact of that programme has had on their, on their life chances and how to assess that isn't straightforward. And sometimes it is long term, but nonetheless, I think that's, that's actually where you get the much richer source of evidence about uh, an evaluation about uh, what you're doing um, yes we we have obviously got with with the different kind of organizations we've got a very direct relationship with ie we're funding we've got sort of a suite of kind of kpis um, that we are sort of measuring i suppose their impact around we're trying to keep those quite light and we're also trying to keep them in the space of um, a sort of slightly less traditional way of evaluating things and we are at the moment um, mapping out um, alongside a kind of theory of change uh, where we think um, we could evaluate the overall work of the unit but more critically working with partners such as the NHS where they've got uh, big aspirations to uh, have a, a, a data academy and um, how we can work with them to present a broader picture of violence reduction um, across London. We're connected into the Youth Endowment Fund um, and obviously we've got some specific conditions um, from the uh, Home Office grant. So there's a lot going on um, and some of it is in place and some of it is really being developed and if you had greater um, which you obviously will have if you've got kind of ideas and greater expertise then you know really encourage you to you know get in contact with us and, and work with us on that okay i've got i've got a few final questions um, and time is definitely running out on us so what i'm going to do and um, apologies to those who've asked questions and have already asked one i'm going to take the two remaining questions that i have from from uh, from people who haven't asked as yet uh, so the first is from our newest member of staff uh, amal ali and, and she asks what progress has been made in involving grassroots organizations particularly those that are bame led in determining violence reduction strategies okay um i mean we've made that an absolute core mission um, of the unit um, and so as I mentioned earlier on we've gone out spoken to and tried to support uh, very deliberately initiatives that are grassroots and uh, very uh, deliberately supported um, initiatives that are uh, BME, BAME um, BAME because we know uh, the disproportionate impact of, of violence on those communities and to give you sort of two examples of that um, we're funding at the moment 39 grassroots organisations across London. Um, it was called Knife Crime Seed Funding. There's a variety of activities, some of which are diversionary activities for young people, um, some, of, some of which are um, more therapeutic, um, but all of them are really supporting, uh, supporting uh, very, very 
small community um, initiatives um, and the support hasn't just come in that traditional uh, uh, funder recipient uh, relationship what we've been trying to do is work with them and Darwin's been in the forefront of some of this working with them to talk about their capacity talk about how we can support their evaluation so that when we find a good idea we're in a position to be able to um, scale up we are starting a program of uh, support for um, some uh, black led organizations uh, through Hackney uh, CVS which has been has done some excellent work working with the council there on developing a young black men's uh, program and young uh, black men's um, ambassadors and we're very keen to make sure that we're supporting a consortium bid there which is around a, a lot more than just um, you know what programs can they do with young people but also looking about how, looking at how you can uh, capacity uh, develop um, and that sounds a bit jargonistic but I think it's it's a move away from just the program to looking at you know how the organization sort of roots itself in a community and how we can help uh, support that development so those are just two examples um, but uh, which hopefully illustrate the seriousness by which we take that approach um, and also some of the work that we've done Brilliant. Thank you. So one one last question. And just to say that for for, for um, Charlie and Gemma, who'd asked supplementaries, I'll, I'll live. I'll, if, it, if it's OK, I'll arrange for an email to be sent to you. Yeah, to them yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, 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 no problem. Yeah. But um, the, the final question comes from Matt. And I'm afraid I don't know which Matt and I can think of many uh, that this might be. But but um, here's the question. Many uh, voluntary community organisations welcomed the VRU funding that came out last year, that enabled organisations to tender to deliver some innovative practices. However, and you probably could guess there'd be a however coming after that. First <laughs> however, in some VRU areas, funding was extremely short, four months in one circumstance or some circumstances. This uh, really hit some organizations ability to mobilize services and demonstrate any meaningful impact how do you think we can circumnavigate these issues to maximize value for money and achieve sustainable impact well I mean this is all about long-term funding isn't it and it's all about going back to the long-term long-term approach um, you know I, I did welcome and I still do the, the, the money that we've got from the Home Office um, but you know let's be under no illusion that we got the money in August and had to spend it by March and we were in a relatively fortunate position in London because we'd already established a violence reduction uh, unit and I'm sure Kimberly can talk about even more kind of the challenges of being sort of set up and suddenly with that you know uh, um, importance of spend and 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 and, and that's the, the difficulty of that is therefore trying you, you can't build something sustainable on such a short um funding uh, timeline um and and so what we we've been in a you know in a better position because we've got the mayoral budget which is a long-term commitment um, which we're hoping to keep on adding to um, both by home office funding any other funding and, and also an increase from the mayor um when appropriate as well and that gives us a little bit more space to try and do that long-term long-term piece of making sure that we're not asking community groups but very often small groups small vcs's to con you know take out a massive chunk of their um working time on developing a a, a um funding bid um on an annual basis we want to move we really do want to move away away from that um but all of our intentions need to be met actually by us having ourselves a longer term source, a longer term uh, source of funding. So I suppose in answer to your question, Matt, the intention is there for us to develop a much longer term programme. Our messaging is all around the sustainability and the importance of long term of a, of a long term um, proposition for violence reduction units. Um, and we will try as much as we can uh, to give security um, and simplicity um, in terms of forms and bureaucracy to small organisations. But to a certain extent, we are a little bit limited about to where our budget comes from. Um, so it kind of, if I could just wrap it up to say, I think it makes the point um, that we all need to be really working together to amplify the long term needs of funding to make the whole violence reduction agenda so much more um, sustainable for, for everyone. So we'll move swiftly on to our panel discussion on violent reduction in custody and the community. Uh, because we're running slightly behind time, I'm going to simply uh, uh, announce 
each of the of the presenters. So we start with Darwin Bernando, who has had a, a great uh, write up um, uh, as we've gone about what, what he might talk about and what he might not talk about. So Darwin is the community engagement lead for the London Violence Reduction uh, Unit, and he also founded the Nutmeg Community Project. Darwin, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, wow, where to begin? So much has been said by Lib already. Uh, um, I guess where my role comes into it is my sort of local community sort of experience. So founding a youth charity back in 2006, you know, when I was only 17 years old, I didn't really know how to even set one up. But I guess it was a passion and will to make a difference in my community that allowed me to work with sort of the local authorities, police establishments and local housing um, associations. And I guess one of the fundamental things I've been able to carry over from that grassroots initiative to here at the VRU is the importance of ensuring that the message we are sending to communities are being reached by them and not just within the medium that we normally use on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes we within our departments know what we're doing, but yet how is that being reflected to the communities on the ground who seem to be very skeptical of the work of central government and what they're really doing, you know? And a lot of the questions always been, well, I didn't know about this. How can I get involved? And I think that's where my role within the VIU has been focused on. How do we ensure that the voices of those mostly affected by violence, whether victim or perpetrators, are actually included in all of our discussions? Um, and that comes around with language. I talk about language because I think that's very fundamental to everyone because people understand violence in one way to someone else. So one of the target audience that I predominantly work with is young people. So for example, we know the youth terminology changes on a day-to-day -day basis. If I was to ask all our panel members and even the audiences at home, think of the word home, come up with as many different variety youth terminology used to describe home. I'll give you guys 10 seconds. Amongst yourself, just how many words can you come up to describe home from a youth perspective? Let that, feel free to add in the comments. Think of the word home, youth terminologies. 10, 9, 7, 6, 5. Yeah, okay, I've got some responses coming in the chat. Crib, keep going, keep going. Mom and dad, nagging. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like that. Um, and I guess. Keep, keep coming in while I give my speech. I've only got five minutes. I guess the importance of talking about language is because we all understand the same information in different ways. So it's how do we get to the point where we remove all the jargon and just bring things down to a normal level that everyone can understand. I mean, it's a, it's a great moment, especially during this COVID-19 moment where we're talking about the importance of clear language and the importance of people understanding what is needed during this time in terms of keeping everyone safe. You got everyone from different sectors coming together, which obviously amplifies the public health model approach, which Lib was talking about. But yet everyone's sending the exact same message, which is stay home, save lives. So how do we implement that model into our day-to-day -day working as well, ensuring that young people, parents, the local authorities, the police established, we're all utilizing the same language when we're talking about violence in its entirety. And I guess one of the things that Nina was talking about is obviously the importance around changing the narrative. Uh, my role within City Hall has always been how do we get out into the communities? You know, some people see City Hall as, as an anti-establishment, they don't really want to engage with them. So within my first two weeks of my role, I literally got 200 young people from pupil ferry units, youth offending teams in Ken, out of care leavers to attend an open evening at City Hall where they can speak to the mayor directly. People are thinking, whoa, how are you going to bring 200 different gang members, young people from different crews, young people who don't potentially like to come to City Hall in this establishment? The only reason we was able to do that is because we connected with the youth workers, youth offending teams, the local community, and actually got them to bring young people with them. The importance of including people from the offset is important. You can't just come up with a plan and think people are just going to buy into your plan. You have to get them involved from day one. So a lot of our work is always around how do we ensure we keep people informed, but yet get them to tell us what needs to be done? Um, I know there was a question around, you know, grassroots and with the BAME communities. So one of the things that we've tried to do is focusing on, we've got 40 um, grassroots organizations that 
young people have highlighted to us, oh, this is where I go when I want to feel safe, or this is where me and my friends go to get information on how we can develop ourselves. So we took those organizations that young people talked about, you know, the ones behind the burger joints, the ones behind the boxing alleyways, the ones that, you know, the buildings are collapsing and actually said, how can we support you around capacity building? Because essentially these are the ones that never go through through application forms. They don't have the right governance. They don't have the time because if they have to do frontline work, who's doing the administrative work behind them? So that's why they never get the opportunity to apply for sustainable funding. It's always short-term funding, six months. But then, you know, working with some of these hard to reach young people, it takes about six months to get them to buy into you. And then all of a sudden it's, what do you do once the project's finished with its funding? So a lot of the work which even Lib mentioned is all looking around long-term funding angles for these organizations. So we're not just looking at one year funding, but looking at two to three years and predominantly focused on capacity building because there's no point giving an organization loads of money if then you're going to have the same perpetuating situation going on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's something that we need to do around community investment, around capacity building. And, you know, the old proverb talks about it takes a village to raise a child. Well, some areas will say, well, there's no crime in my area, so why do I need to care about the violence agenda? Well, actually, how do we ensure that none of it happens in your area? So we need to get you at the table as well. Because some people seem to distance themselves from the topic because they don't feel like it affects them, but it affects everyone. And until people get that message, then we're always going to be in a position whereby some will get involved, some won't get involved. My aim is to try and bring everyone together. We're all understanding from the same hymn book and being in a position whereby we're sharing best practice. We're exposing smaller organizations to other organizations. I mean, at City Hall, you can have a network of thousands of businesses and that simple grass organization just wants to know, do you have someone who can give us marketing expertise? Because organizations are really great working in their local community, but it's very hyper-local. Outside of that postcode, they are not known to anyone else. So how do we join that work between these different organizations and ensure that there's no duplications, they're not applying for the same pot of funding, they're not out trying to bid each other, but yet there's a consortium of people coming together within a local borough. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with our youth action group um, is obviously getting young people being recruited from the Pru's youth offending team and care leaving background and ensuring that we're not going for, oh, let's get 100 young people to be part of the violence reduction youth action group because that's just not feasible. How do we get a small cohort of young people that we can give proper tailored support? How do we, because you always get young people who, you know, I call them serial volunteers. They're the ones that just put their hands up to take part in anything and anything. I mean, they're doing great. But what about the ones who are involved in violence? What about the ones who know the perpetrators? What, how do we get them in a conversation? And you can only do that if you're in their local community and they're regular see you. They don't see you as a threat. They see you more as an opportunity, an opportunity to get away from that lifestyle. And the fact that we're going through this COVID-19 scenario at the moment gives us frontline workers that opportunity to actually engage with these young people because they can't go outside in the streets trapping because no one's going out. They don't want to be nabbed by the police because it's like, well, what's your central journey here? You don't look like you're wearing any sports gear, so why are you leaving your house? So how do we get them involved? And this is the perfect opportunity for us to do that. So at the moment, we're launching a lot of online webinars with some of these young people looking around entrepreneurship development, looking at opportunities that they, because at the end of the day, they want to try and make money and um, self-sustain themselves so that then they can feel that they can protect their family or their household. So putting in a lot of resources into that really support. So us funding different organizations who are working with these hard to reach is sort of being one of our key mandates. Well, for me personally, because I'm here talking to you from the VRU, but you know, I live on custard cream biscuits. You know, I was drinking Fanta this morning. I mean, I'm not saying I live a perfect, healthy lifestyle, but it just comes to show that it doesn't matter where you are based because it's all about how are you still true to who you are and every work I do in the VRU all comes down to when I go back to my community I'm still dealing with the prospect of violence in my community I'm still you know I haven't moved anywhere I'm still here in the suburbs I don't know how well you guys know Grand Park Estate in Collindale but we are still predominantly known to be in the top 10 most dis um, disengaged communities um, pan London so it's keeping that authenticity as well 
and people being able to see people that look like them still championing a positive message and not being victim to the circumstances of their local postcode. I mean, I can go more into it about the mobilization or journeys for communities, getting them to amplify the message on your behalf. But I think that's my five minutes and willing to take any questions. Thanks, Darren. That's fantastic. And, and you've kicked us off very well. I'll call in all of our panel speakers first. And then in the remaining time that we have, we'll take questions for all or for any individuals. So if you've got questions, do start flagging them up. Um, I'm going to sound like a broken record till we get more than 14 votes for the poll. Um, I can see that we've still got 33 participants. So there must be some of you who are having trouble voting. If you're having trouble voting, but, but want to vote, please send an email to, to Jamie uh, and, and we can add that to our, our total. But we do need to get to the 16 point. Um, okay, our second speaker is, is Kimberly Lamb. Uh, and Kimberly comes from the, she's the head of the Bedfordshire Violence and Exploitation Reduction Unit. Prior to um, taking on this role, she'd worked with um, uh, uh, Bedfordshire Police in respect of victim services and early intervention. Kimberly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so yes, I'm Kimberly Lamb. I'm the head of Bedfordshire's Violence and Exploitation Reduction Unit. So we are slightly different in that we call ourselves a VERU as opposed to a VRU and that's because we want to amplify the idea that exploitation we believe is quite closely aligned um, to some of the violence that we're experiencing. Um, just a little bit about myself yes my background is i'm very uh, community focused worked in commune um, in education also youth offending but for myself to be quite honest with you um some of what darwin talked about um darwin and i have spoken um holds really true for me a lot of um what i do a lot of the the vru i guess that i run is informed by the fact that um, i myself have had lived experience and i'm working very closely with those who've had lived experience as well so i understand in a violent reduction unit the importance of having that representation that understanding and working with people who are closest to the issue. Um, so the way that we have uh, run our BRU in Bedfordshire, so we're um, very small compared to London, I take that on board. Um, we have three local authorities, uh, 670,000 residents um, throughout the whole of Bedfordshire. But our key focus, I guess, is the fact that we have a rural and urban area as well. So that sort of leads the way that our strategy works um, and some of the challenges that we have. So uh, yes, London um, has some challenges, but we see that. We're only 23 minutes on the train um, up the M1. So we see a lot of the, some of the same issues there. Now our board, just like everybody else, or sorry, our unit is set up um, it has an oversight board um, that is a strategic board if you like that um, is, is chaired by one of our CEOs of our local authority um, on there and then we have the usual suspects I call them we have the police and crime commissioner sitting on there we have clinical advisors educational advisors on there, academic advisors on there um, just making sure that we've got that direction strategic direction we're going in the right way um, below that and um, I, I make no um, I don't keep this to myself. I think we have our very important tactical board. Um, the reason I say that quite openly is it's that is the board where we have our communities that sit on there, our young people that sit on there. So at, at the moment, our very youth panel, we call them, um, is sourced from a local alternative provision. But it's also at the tactical level or operational level um, that I make sure that we've got housing that are sat there as well. Um, again, we talk about people closest to the issue, the importance of that. Um, and then of course we have youth offending officers and bits and pieces the reason i mention that is because that sets the firm direction and the core of what we do and deliver as a violent reduction unit um, our tactical board for example will oversee and have a look at our delivery programs that we do so we have 43 pro um, 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 projects that we're running at the moment um, for a small area that seems like a lot but very similar to London that encompasses um, um, a lot of grassroots people again um, I know the importance of having grassroots organization what they bring and also their reach um, you know again we work alongside in partnership with our statutory um, partners um, but for us our community voice and our youth-led voice is very very important because again that feeds into us trying to find this collaborative solution 
So our BRU, like most, uh, there is an emphasis on data um, collection, having a look at that data capture, um, trying to identify, if you like, um, some of those hotspots, we call them, on their being led by the data, but also challenging that data and making sure that when we look at that data, it's not just in its entirety. So um, we are interested in A&E data, ambulance data, but we're interested as to how that overlaps with some of the policing data as well. So that's some of the work that goes on in our VRU. My team, there are 14 of us. Um, I have a team of analysts. Um, I have obviously um, administrative support in there, communications and engagement. Darwin mentioned the importance of that language, making sure that we're not just talking to our statutory partners and sitting in our little echo chambers um, and our silos, making sure that we go out to the wider community, we use the right language, we use the right language from the young people, and that we listen to them as well and hear about that ever-changing language uh, that Darwin talked about, really important for us as well. In terms in terms of um, a, a question I asked myself before coming onto this panel actually, um, what difference does having a VRU have? Now our VRU is very embryonic compared to what Lib Peck talked about earlier. We only started in September and when I say we I mean me. I came in and I headed it up and I had to staff it fully, find accommodation what have you for us. Um, but before accepting the appointment, it was really important for me to sort of think about, you know, what difference are we going to make? So again, Darwin mentioned, we hear very often people saying, are we already doing this? Or we know what the issue is, we're not talking to the right people. And I had the same questions mainly because I think I'm a resident first, a community member first, and perhaps a worker later, but I had the same uh, questions. But actually, I can honestly say for us in Bedfordshire, a VRU definitely is important. And the reason for us is that it's allowed us to hone our focus, to make sure that those silos that are out there, and again, I'm not talking about statutory silos, organisational ones, we also have silos within our communities. So our VRU has allowed us to, to, to speak to communities, to hear things, to bring things together, to be collaborative. We've only been around for six months, so we haven't changed the world out there, but it has allowed us to data share, have those conversations, and something that I'm quite well known about for as well, have those uncomfortable conversations around the BAME community, around our traveller community, and making sure that when we say that we listen to the community voice, are we being inclusive? So challenges to come to an end. The type of challenges I've had, well, we've only been around for six months, um, but those challenges have been partnership working. I'm really pleased to say now that our three local authorities are very much involved and have driven some of the strategy, the um, you know, strategic needs assessment that we've got at the moment, our problem profile, they've been very much involved in that. But that was a challenge at the beginning, um, getting data from within education, um, challenging that data trying to understand why people don't share data as well, you know, whether it's a, a resource thing on there. So we've had those challenges, um, partnership challenges, trying to be collaborative and bits and pieces on there. Um, in terms of ongoing challenges, I have to mention COVID-19. Now, I would say a month ago, I would have been telling you about some other ongoing challenges and barriers and things, but now I'm just going to focus on, and let's keep it real, the COVID-19 um, challenge that we have. Our 43 community projects that we had out there were impacted. Some of them are in schools, some of them were working with our more complex families and young people, vulnerable young people. We've had to, like everybody else, react really quickly to that change. So we're trying to become more digitalized, but we also recognize that vulnerable people, vulnerable young people, are used to that one-to-one -one. so we're, we're trying to find a new way of working we haven't got the answer but we've been able to mobilize quite quickly and just to end the reason i think we've been able to mobilize quite quickly over the last i'd say week or so two weeks is because we've got that relationship that we've worked so hard with with our partners the pcc's office the police the understanding and i think you know just to end moving forward in the future for us it is about those the importance of relationship it, it's no good being one of 18 VRUs and just popping up and then wondering why our young people are disengaged from the police, for example, but knowing that we need that relationship. Um, our future will be to continue that, 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 that community, looking at the, our community assets, looking um, at the community silos, understanding why they happen and just working together with our statutory organisations um, and, and really rolling out a five year strategic response, collaborative response to serious youth violence um, and, and, and county lines and bits and pieces there. Thank you. Kimberly, thank you so much.
really, really stimulating and thought provoking. Um, okay, our, our third of our four speakers is Charlotte Culkin. Charlotte is the director of the Restorative Engagement Forum uh, and her particular background and skill set that she brings to bear on this subject is in restorative justice, uh, an area that she's been working in for the last decade. Uh, and she holds, and I hope I'm not embarrassing you with this, Charlotte, you, you'll probably know that I've got it in, in front of me. Yeah, she's got a, a master's from Cambridge University on the use of restorative practices in prison. Charlotte, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, lovely to be a part of this discussion. Thank you, everybody, for what you've said. Um, I work within prisons and I work in the community and so I want to draw a little bit on what uh, Darwin and Kimberley have said and I completely agree with them. In restorative practice what we are doing is it's all about communication and it's all about giving people a voice and it's all about the language that we use. So I think it's um, very important that we are all kind of connecting up together. Some of the most interesting work that I've done recently has been out in Colombia, uh, which was a city mayor's uh, project, really interesting. Which and So what I do now is I work mainly in restorative practice. I used to work more in restorative justice. And where I define the, di the difference is that restorative justice is very much post-harm, bringing people who've been impacted by harm together to have dialogue to heal the harm. So that's very much how I define the restorative justice. The work that I do now is much more restorative practice. And that is uh, following on a lot from the work that goes on in schools, which is using the same techniques, but to be preventative, which is why it's so important that it's part of this discussion. So it's preventing the harm from happening in the first place by using the same restorative techniques. And uh, the work that I've done has been in Prus and uh, with young people and, you know, preventing people from going down the custody route, then working in custody. And then the program in Colombia is with 50 young offenders once they've been released from prison, from custody, reintegrating them back into the community. And so I think that restorative practice can be used through all of these uh, parts of the process. And um, I was asked to talk specifically about restorative practice in custody, but it's so interesting to me that most of the conversation has been about work in the community and I don't, I don't want the power of restorative practice in the community to be kind of diminished because actually that is where the majority of my work lies is within the community and particularly with young people um, and a lot to do with young people and the police. But I'll talk a little bit about the, the work that I've done in custody which is so I worked as a practitioner with it. So I've worked in about 43 prisons, but when I did my research, it was on prisons that were good prisons. They're known to be prisons that have low violence, uh, low uh, self-harm. They are good prisons. And what I was interested in seeing was how restorative practice was supporting ongoing cultural change like rehabilitative culture, enabling environments, procedural justice. I wanted to know how the toolkit, the skills of restorative practice were supporting these good prisons. And it was absolutely fascinating to me to see how much power and influence they had. And again, going back to what Darwin and Kimberley said, it's all about language. It's all about language and it, it was very empowering and what I noticed that, that, that the, the what I noticed amongst the residents in the prisons was that they felt empowered by having this means of communication I mean I saw I saw I've got endless stories but one um, young man who was trained in restorative practice and he used to use it formally 
to have conversations between people within the prison who were in conflict with each other. But he would also just use it informally. He would just de-escalate situations. He would resolve tensions. He would diffuse things. And other officers told me about this resident who, he'd say, well, him coming along, he just, he just, it was high and he just brought the situation down. And so it was the skill of being able to reduce potential violence by using restorative practice that I noticed so much when I was working in these prisons. And as a result, it gave the prison and the residents far more of a sense of community. That was the noticeable difference. Everyone was invested in the community that they lived in, which if you think that at least 50% of the population don't want to be there, that's pretty remarkable that they've managed to get investment within their community. Um, so there was much more of a sense of feeling empowered. Um, there was a sense of having a voice. There was more of a sense of being connected with each other by using these skills. And um, it, uh, they were also used in adjudications. How long have I talked for? Um, they were also used in adjudications, which is the kind of like the internal court systems within prisons. And in each of the prisons I researched, they were using restorative practice. So it was much more about consequences rather than punishments. And one of my favorite quotes came from um, a young man who said, you know, punishing is completely ineffective. By punishing me, you are validating my badness. And I thought that was a deeply profound quote. And so when they're working restoratively, we're working with consequences and ownership and accountability. And this created a far, far better environment within the prisons. So um, that's what I do. I do it all over the world and um, I do it in the community, I do it in prisons and I think that it's an immensely valuable skill that can support a lot of the other initiatives that are taking place. Um, some of the things we've done, we've worked in a maximum security prison where we did big restorative circles around the use of spice within the prison. Uh, to create uh, investment amongst everyone who lived and worked in that community to reducing the drug use, which then de-escalates violence and improves the whole climate of the prison. I could give you hundreds of uh, examples and um, I'm not going to, but I would like to echo what's been said a lot today, which is long-term funding. I mean, the tragedy of the Colombian program, which is one of the most extraordinary programs I've worked on, which was reintegrating um, people back into the community under the age of 23. Beautiful program, giving education, giving work, giving psychosocial support, all underpinned by a restorative philosophy, which was my part of the project. And then the elections came and the mayor changed and that was that. And so I completely agree that this needs to be much longer term initiatives. I think I'm going to shut up there. Well, Charlotte, I could have listened to you all morning. So, uh, and I particularly <laughs> liked your, your quote about validating badness. I think that's, yeah, that's beautiful, a, isn't it? stunning insight. But thank you very much for, for that opening contribution. Colleagues, we've got one final uh, member of our panel to speak. Uh, and the, uh, at the end of that, there'll be an opportunity to ask either specific questions or any general questions to the panel. Um, so, so please start thinking about those and adding them to the, to the chat line. Um, and, and then we will move um, into that part of the meeting. But before we do that, um, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Papapafalu, and I'm Apologise if I just slaughtered your name, because I've been absolutely trying to get it absolutely fluent, um, and uh, I, know, I know I haven't. So you made a valiant <laughs> effort. Well I done. Made, well, I made an effort. Um, <laughs> it's not so, for anyone <laughs> playing uh, along. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Stephanie is director of impact and innovation with Leap 
confront, confronting uh, and is a trained mediator and solicitor uh, by background, has worked for Amnesty International and in her CV has also got uh, a role uh, as a disputes resolution manager. So um, I think we probably have got a bit of a clue about where you may be coming from, but the floor is yours, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, so the challenge is always going last after a day like this. I have so much to link, but I'm going to try and be as concise as possible. And I think it's brilliant that I'm following Charlotte, actually, because the examples that I want to give about some of our work in prisons, uh, one of those particularly follows a restorative model and a lot of the underpinnings of our work at least confronting conflict is uh, with the restorative um, principles. Uh, so just a little bit of background. So at Leap Confronting Conflict, uh, we focus on conflict, um, particularly youth conflict, and we use experiential learning techniques to help participants to reflect on themselves, their choices, their consequences of those choices, uh, their skills, um, their value, and we provide tools and frameworks to help them to manage conflict in their lives. Um, our purpose is to provide the skills to help participants to manage conflict in their lives, reduce violence in their communities and help lead our society. Um, so I want to give a few examples today, you know, as, uh, as many people in this um, panel have said, we work in the community, uh, we work around the reduction of violence and crime prevention in the community um, and also in care settings and education settings, uh, but I'll focus today on our work in the secure estate. Um, and I guess across all three of these examples that I'm going to give, uh, I guess I want to emphasize the importance of that increasing of self-awareness for those participants, whether they be prisoners or officers, um, and in turn self-worth around that, so recognizing their value and what they have to bring and the skills that they have to bring. Uh, listening, absolutely, to prisoners and to staff and helping them to listen to one another. So one of those restorative principles coming in there. Um, and the giving of responsibility. Uh, so all of the um, examples that I'm going to give are looking at that responsibility giving, which actually requires a lot of trust on the part of both the prison and uh, those working with those involved. Um, so the first example that I'll mention is a three-year program that we've got uh, that comes to an end this year in uh, HMP Bronzefield, um, the women's prison. And we were initially brought in around perceptions of safety. There was um, prisoners feeling very unsafe. And so we designed a program that worked on the induction unit. So uh, we did one day training around understanding conflict. So helping all the women coming into the prison systematically uh, to understand their own responses to conflicts, their own relationships with conflict and give them some tools and skills to be able to work with that. Uh, we also had once a month um, two five half day courses which deepened that understanding for those that wanted to come on that. And a major part of the program was training up peer workers to co-deliver that training with our LEAP trainer. And uh, one of the biggest successes of this program was the peer worker model. So um, those that attended the program would talk about how much they gained from actually learning from their peer. Um, I've got a couple of quotes here. Uh, knowing that the peers were also inmates and in the same boat and understanding uh, meant that that was meaningful. Um, you got to know that you're not the only person going through what you're going through. Um, and they noted that they could speak more openly in the room and felt more understood. Um, so that's been a really significant part, both for those attending the training and also for the peer workers delivering it, as they really got to know the tools and frameworks from delivering that uh, work on a repeated basis. They had a role, they had responsibility, and they also had a sense of responsibility um, linking to what Charlotte just said about their environment. So even though uh, the purpose of that training wasn't to have those peer workers intervening in conflict situations outside of the training at all, it actually turns out that they did that. So they would involve themselves uh, with individuals who are facing some internal conflicts that they needed to speak through. They'd involve themselves with peer-to-peer -peer conflict and also in terms of assaults um, on staff. So I'll move on because uh, of time. A second example that I wanted to give um, was around, it was a program that we did in Wandsworth. 
and training men up as violence reduction representatives. So for that one, we received 100 applications from men interested in doing that role. And we had some criteria, for example, not having been involved in assaults for six months prior to the program and having some credibility or influence in the prison. Uh, they then underwent a five day program to gain conflict coaching skills. Uh, so that they could then work with their peers and de-escalate violent situations in the prison. They worked really closely with the violence reduction team. Um, and uh, the beautiful thing about this program is that they would go into that role and they performed that role. But what actually arose out of the training was that some of those um, violence reduction representatives said, actually, I've got an idea for a program that we could do that might help others to reduce their involvement in crime on the outside. Um, and so we were brought back in to assist that group that had come up with this new idea for a program to create that into a program that they could then deliver to others, um, which was a really beautiful piece of work. So again, it was that empowering of those prisoners, giving them responsibility, trusting in their lived expertise within the prison, and then actually giving them that sustained support to be able to create that into something that they could then uh, take out to others. I thought I'd just give you um, a little quote from one of the VR reps. Uh, he said, Leap's course has helped with conflict understanding and about conflict resolution. It's a life skill that can be used outside in any situation. I've also seen changes in the men that I talk to. They see violence reduction reps as an example, and the young ones now see them as an older character that they can relate to, but someone who's changed, someone that they can talk to in a mediation point. I now want to be setting a good example for them, how to do prison life and life on the outside. Uh, you can tell them that you don't want to go down a road where you ended up with a 20 year sentence. I just thought that was really nice reflection across the whole program. And similarly from staff, uh, one said the staff also took part in the sessions and acknowledged not only seeing a positive impact on the levels of violence in the prison, but also that it strengthened trust and communication between staff and prisoners. Um, they bonded as a community, I'll, I'll stop the quote there, but uh, just for time. But I think that that influence between the working relationship between staff and prisoners is really important. The third example, which I'll do very, very quickly, uh, is um, we did a piece of work called the Peaceful Prisons Project over three years. We did a load of research into drivers of violence in prisons. You'll probably um, all uh, uh, recognize these, but we saw staff prisoner relationships, gang involvement, drugs, debt, and shame as key drivers of violence in prison. We chose to focus on the staff prisoner relationships, but also to um, input some community circles, which could then address some of those other drivers of violence. So talking about violence on the wings, talking about drugs, talking about uh, debt, etc. What actually came out was some of the drivers of violence in prison were less about those major things and also more about the little things. So not having enough toilet paper came up. And um, what happened in the circles which were participated in by prisoners and prison officers was that there was empathy created, there was trust built. Um, and that actually meant that they saw each other in a different way and they addressed um, the issues in a different way. So people were listened to and people um, were given the time of day. We saw a reduction in the use of restraint um, from the staff that participated in the program, which was another contributor to violence. Uh, and um, and uh, maybe I'll stop there. Um, I guess overall the challenges that we've found is um, staff churn. Uh, when you've trained up prisoners and staff for certain roles or staff are overseeing different programs, it's very difficult to maintain those when the prisoners are moved out or the staff are shifting roles or actually the staff just have this as one other thing on top of their already high load of work, um, which was something that we never saw before benchmarking um, before 2016. We would have staff in the room as we delivered all the time. And that's really shifted. Um, the lack of experience of staff. So we're finding that we're doing a lot of training of staff in kind of the basics of that conflict and communication um, and sustaining programs. If you don't have that longer term um, staff and prisoner presence, then it's really difficult to sustain programs without us just coming back in, which then costs money. So all of those link back to systemic issues that I think the CJA is uh, looking at and on top of. I'll stop there. <laughs> Brilliant. 
Stephanie, thank you so much. And, and your examples really give vitality to, to, to the issue. So, so they were brilliant. And, and as we all have learned over the last two or three weeks, the issue of toilet paper is important not only in prisons, but also elsewhere. So that was really good. Colleagues, we've got a, about 10 minutes or so to, to complete this webinar. Um, I haven't as yet uh, had notice of any questions. So perhaps you'll indulge me and I'll kick off with a question for, for each member of the panel first. And I'll, 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 I'll go in the order that we heard from, from, from colleagues in the first place. But, but, it, but it's, the, it's the old question of, of a wish. And I guess it's asking each of you, if you had a magic wand, but only one wish, what, what one thing would you be hoping uh, could happen that you think would make a real um, sea change type change to to the the, the challenges uh, as as you perceive them, Darwin? Can I start with you? Um, I think one wish would just be um, better access to information that currently exists that sort of allow communities to thrive because there is a lot of resources out there, but it's just not being channeled down to the right level of people. And if people knew, okay, for me to get to here, I literally just have to do this, and this is exactly what you need to do, then I feel that would eradicate a lot of the problems, especially around um, like bureaucracy and um, people finding it difficult to access information. But if it was presented to people in a way that they understand, that they get fully behind, then I think that would help eradicate a lot of the issues. That, that's a brilliant start, thank you. And, and, and uh, I do work in this area in East London, particularly with children under 18s. And uh, I, I am both impressed and feel optimistic about the, the range of potential resources that are available, but completely share your view about how difficult it is to map them and be aware of them, let alone to, to get them connected to individual children or families or what have you. So a really, a really good um, start for us. Kimberly, over to you. Uh, just really building on what's been said or reinforcing it actually one of the things that I would love to see is the recognition of the importance of capacity building with some of our more grassroots organizations and I mean that um, in the funding stream so you know um, helping to capacity build and also understanding about capital investment the importance of that you know we have some really good car mechanics out there who perhaps don't know how to run a garage to use an analogy and um, so I would like a focus on that and if I can be cheeky and squeeze one other thing in I would love to see better representation in the violent reduction units there are 18 of us um, and one of the things that perhaps took me longer to do was to staff the way that I felt it should be so that representation is diversity of thought how we look visible BAME people within there I think if we can just make those changes if we could look at the structure and the staffing and the representation within our 18 violent reduction unit, violence reduction units that we have at the moment, and just look at the importance of making sure that we, we get that right, then it'd be easier to communicate with our community. So I'd like to see that. So sorry, a bit naughty, two things. Thank you. Kimberly, you're definitely allowed to, uh, but, but, but no one else is. Uh, and, <laughs> sorry. And, and, no, it's fine. Um, uh, but thank you for that. And, and just to, to give a clue, I've, I've still not had any further questions. So I'll go to our other two speakers. And then I might just turn, if, if I could, Nina, to you to, to add any comment from, from you, and then we'll conclude the seminar. So Charlotte, the floor is yours. Charlotte, you're, you're, you haven't unmuted yourself, so I'm sure it was a great answer, but we have Oh, worked. hello, there you go. Um, yeah, I'm rabbiting away to myself, uh, fairly normal. Um, I, um, I'm going to stick with the field of restorative practice because it's my field. I like the way that uh, the five-minute interventions have been rolled out in the prison uh, in prisons across the country, so it's standard training to every officer now. I would like there to be in the same way that in Wiltshire Police, uh, we've created a one day training in restorative practice for every police officer. I'd like there to be a one day training in restorative practice as part of prison officer training so you don't get the problems with staff churn. 
um, that, that uh, Stephanie was talking about, I would like there to also be more awareness training around this for residents in prisons because it's skills for them to learn after custody. Um, and one, one chap said to me, could you just, you know, come in every three months and just give us all a talk on it so that, you know, we all know how to do this thing and how to, to be in this way. And there's a definite need and, and it's not a difficult thing to do. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and lastly, Stephanie. Yeah, um, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. I think uh, maybe to build is just the resource. So similar to um, the issues of churn, um, it's actually just having bodies on the ground to be able to do the jobs that they need to do and to do that safely. And I think that that's uh, in the prison system particularly. We've seen that really, really um, highlighted there in terms of safety on wings um, and also in the community, you know, the cuts to youth services, the, the wraparound support, the one-to-one -one support that youth workers used to be able to provide because there were more youth workers, there was more funding, um, means that other organisations, means a lack of safety in delivering services for young people actually at the moment. And we've found that we've had to shift operating models to find different ways to support those young people through when they don't have a youth worker supporting them etc so each of those things has knock-on effects and i think that that's really important to have resourcing which seems like the cheat answer but there you go i think that's a great answer so so um can i therefore um begin to bring this to an end i'm going to turn to nina in a second but before i do that can i just thank the four of you, Stephanie, Kimberly, Darwin and Charlotte, uh, difficult circumstances, guys. I thought you were all magnificent. Uh, and I, I've had a couple of comments directly to me privately on the chat line, thanking you for, for really inspiring and, and stimulating uh, set of presentations. But I'm going to leave the final remarks to our director, Nina. Nina, over to you. Um, just to echo that, thank you very much for all our speakers. Um, there's a number of things that we're working on at CJA, which will pick up and hopefully develop uh, this conversation um, and uh, influence policy and practice in these areas. Um, picking up on what Lib was saying about and Darwin was saying about communication in the media, we have our annual media awards. Um, and so just a sort of shout out to people to, if you see good examples of media, um, around talking about violence to make sure that you do nominate them for our, our media awards so that we can reward good practice um, in terms of focusing on solutions and, and changing the narrative. Um, on restorative, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing a whole piece of work about really explaining how restorative could be used right across the criminal justice system from policing, as Charlotte mentioned, to in prisons, as, as Stephanie um, mentioned. So yeah, any examples that people are aware of that they want to flag with me, please do so. Um, and just picking up on those points finally around workforce, um, again that's another key strand of our work both around diversity of workforce, so um, Beverly, uh, Kimberly's points about the VRU staff um, both in terms of racial diversity but also in terms of lived experience which is why we're now trying to get the implementation of the recommendations of the Change From Within report, um, you know, right across the system how can we get more people with lived experience um, into paid positions, um, whether that's frontline service delivery through policy, designing interventions, through you know, big him researchers and evaluators at all different layers. So, uh, and we've obviously also got the serious violence bill, um, which has been paused, um, but obviously when that comes into fruition, we can, we can use a lot of what's been talked about today in um, formulating our, our response to that consultation as well. Thank you very much. Nina, thank you. And colleagues, can I therefore, draw the seminar to a close. Can I in particular give you the very good news that the accounts have been uh, adopted uh, without anyone against and by a quorum of members. So there will be no requirement that everyone comes back in a couple of days time for, for a meeting to look at the accounts. So thank you for persevering with, with you know, an unusual meeting. I hope you've all got something from it. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in person in the not too distant future. But in the meanwhile, keep well, everyone.